All right. Thank you all for being here this evening or afternoon, depending on which part of the world you are in. This marks our seventh lecture during the academic spring semester 2021. Lectures were divided among two classes I'm teaching at Morgan State University School of Architecture and Planning into just cities and circular economy in construction and materials. Today, like Monday, both students and our non-students guests, welcome, have been invited to learn more about materials and their lifespan. We hope this will be opening up a nice discussion and give up the opportunity and give the opportunity to look at the construction, built environment, and design under a new perspective. Please note that this lecture is being recorded and will be shared on the Baltimore Rotterdam Committee YouTube channel. Please also note that we are we have reserved some time after this lecture for questions and answers. The lecture should be running in about 50 minutes. Uh, the same can be typed. These questions can also be typed in the chat window below if you feel more comfortable. Finally, I would like to thank the Baltimore Rotterdam Sister City Committee for supporting all these lectures. And now about our lectures this afternoon or evening. Dr. Piero Medici is a PhD architect currently researcher and lecturer at the Faculty of Architecture in the Built Environment at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands and at the, Ma and at the Master of Architecture in Fontier, Fontis, Fontais University. You can tell me later, Piero. Fontais, I think, yeah. University of Fontis. Applied Science. What Fontis, is yeah. Fontis, Fontis. Okay, Fontis. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Of Applied Sciences in Tilburg, also in the Netherlands. He's a founding partner of the architectural and urban practice called COPE, C-O-P-E, winner of the International European, uh, International European 14. Piero holds a BS in both environmental sciences and architecture by the University of Venice, Italy, and an MS in architecture by the TU Delft in the Netherlands. And the PhD focuses on sustainable architecture by the University of Venice and TU Delft. Piero has 15 years of experience working as a researcher, lecturer, architect, and environmental scientist in various academic institutions and practices, including ENSA Paris, Belleville in France, UCL Bartlett in London, UK, KABK Royal Academy BA in the Netherlands, UF Tafoscari in Venice in Italy, Grimshaw Architects London, UK, and Super U Studios in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Piero is author, author of several publications. His research focuses on European sustainable housing and neighborhoods during the 70s contemporary architecture approach concerning circular economy, degrowth, and the commons. So at this, at this point, all kindly place your mic on mute if you can, if not done so already. And you can keep your camera off uh, if you don't like to be uh, recorded. Please turn your camera on if you like to ask any question. Obviously, Piero, keep your camera on and your mic on and take the floor. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much also for the introduction. And um, yeah, I will start to share my screen. My... Yes, I think you, you can see my my screen now. Um, yeah, so the lecture uh, I will uh, I will give today is uh, entitled The Harvest Map, Precedent and Contemporary Architectural Approaches, and is focusing on uh, materials reuse, the use of materials. And uh, the book uh, you can see in the first slide, uh, Garbage Housing by Martin Poli was published in the 70s in the UK. And Martin Poli was an architect, but also researcher and a lecturer at several institutions in London. He was uh, focusing and publishing on the use of materials uh, uh, also for a different function they were originally designed. So new, new um, using materials for a different, uh, for a different uh, function. So the lecture will be actually uh, composed uh, by four parts. In the first part, uh, the introduction, uh, it, is, it regards uh, technological intervention of sustainable architectural practices, of course, including materials reuse. 
and it will function as a lens uh, to read uh, the three uh, main case studies, the three parts containing some case studies. The first uh, uh, will be about in the 1970s, counterculture in the UK, uh, well, which would be mainly about the secondary use group and the first type of harvest map. Uh, the second is a contemporary Dutch, focusing on contemporary Dutch uh, architects, uh, Super U Studios, and indeed the harvest map. And the third one uh, will be some examples from uh, regarding education, concerning education, student works uh, from uh, many foundation universities. So starting indeed from the first, uh, the introduction from the first part, the first part uh, um, is about the three limitation of uh, sustainable architectural practices, uh, including, of course, the use of materials. These limitations were uh, defined by uh, William Braham from the uh, University of Pennsylvania in 1999, referencing to historians Sigrid Gideon and the theoretician architect uh, Friedrich Kiesler. And uh, the three limitations are regarding health. Uh, the need of the cycle of intervention are changeable, and this could affect the health of the people. Social condition, sustainability is a, a social condition that cannot be applied by experts and or even wholly institutionalized. Maintenance and renewal, and the necessity of regular maintenance and renewal of those sustainable architectural practices. Often these uh, three, let's say, uh, aspects are not regarded by the sustainable architectural practices. And this is a, a part of the failure of, uh, of architecture or of the sustainable architectural uh, solution. So I will uh, recall these, uh, these uh, three limitations during the lecture while illustrating the different case studies. And uh, so this was indeed the, the very first part. Um, and then uh, the second part is the first uh, uh, group of case studies, the first list of case studies regarding the counterculture in the UK. And um, with the um, secondary use group uh, and the first type of harvest map. So I already sent a link in the yeah in the Zoom chat, uh, which is a Padlet about uh, uh, where you can write anonymously. Uh, what do you know about harvest map? What is in your opinion harvest map? You can just uh, write uh, whatever. You can also write questions there. Of course, later after the lecture, you can also ask questions not anonymously, let's say. Um, so let's start uh, starting indeed with this uh, first uh, uh, part. Um, this, uh, the secondary use uh, group uh, was operating in the 70s and um, the young architects uh, uh, were uh, students of uh, Martin uh, Pauli, the author of the book uh, in my first slide. Um, the, um, they were, uh, during the 1970s, there was a financial and um, energy crisis, the oil crisis, and also a financial crisis worldwide. Uh, so um, these uh, architects uh, were, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, finding uh, and looking for uh, resources, uh, affordable resources and affordable materials. They were indeed uh, collecting uh, materials uh, uh, nearby the building site and uh, using these materials uh, with do-it-yourself practices for building uh, shelters, for building uh, uh, small houses. They were testing uh, even the, um, the structure of the, of the beam, um, beam con constructed with, uh, uh, with cans or uh, with big crates, uh, or um, reuse the pieces of wood and shredded paper for the insulation. Uh, they were, uh, in order to do it, uh, they were also uh, initiators, let's say, of uh, cooperative practices uh, with local businesses, uh, because the local businesses were providing materials, uh, most of the times for free, like restaurants, uh, they were getting rid of their uh, waste in this way. And this is um, uh, one of the shelter they built, and this is a, a diagram from an architectural design in the, in the 70s, the diagram from the super secondary use group, indeed, from them. And it is illustrating their main strategy. Um, it's uh, about where the materials are collecting, uh, how far from the building site, where they are stored, and uh, where they are worked, worked on and uh, modified. 
so everything needs to be in a radius more or less of 20 kilometers to be affordable. This was uh, uh, one of the uh, conclusion. And um, um, yeah, this is also, let's say, a map uh, which can help as a tool to collect the materials. First type of harvest map, the real harvest map, or at least the name harvest map uh, was uh, coined a couple of decades ago uh, and afterwards in the Netherlands. So with the same strategy, they were also building more, let's say, uh, complete uh, and the complex buildings like this uh, house, uh, uh, which was uh, also uh, partially self-reliant in terms of uh, energy and food with the um, yeah, living and um, uh, dining uh, area, a greenhouse, uh, also um, indeed the self-reliant in terms of uh, energy and water and food. So um, these are, uh, let's say, um, these uh, these uh, case studies uh, were not really focusing on the on regarding the three limitations uh, um, concerning health and the social condition maintenance and renewal. This was part of the reason why these case studies were casted apart in the after the seventies. Um, frankly speaking, the main, uh, uh, to be precise, the main reasons why these case studies, why the counterculture of the seventies was casted was casted apart in the eighties. Uh, was because uh, the oil price uh, became uh, uh, decreased again. Uh, so, and also academia and the mainstream uh, architectural practice uh, is, uh, were not so focusing on the counterculture, not even in the 70s, but still uh, regarding these three limitations uh, uh, was important that they did not uh, uh, so much uh, focus on that. They were mainly focusing on the technical and technological part. And uh, so after the first uh, group of case studies, um, the attention, I will illustrate the contemporary Dutch, uh, let's say, um, Super U Studios uh, um, and, uh, and their uh, harvest map, the name they gave uh, to their harvest map tool that you can see here on the uh, left hand side, um, where they, uh, which they used, which we used, I was working together with them at the time, we used uh, to uh, transform, to improve the um, building of the Faculty of Architecture in Delft. We reused the um, double glazed uh, window from uh, local buildings which were about to tear down. And uh, we also focused on the three limitation because we tried to create uh, spaces uh, for uh, social uh, connectivity, uh, where the social condition was regarded, the spaces for leisure, the spaces of, of course also for work, and the existing corridors uh, were now serving uh, the two sides, uh, not only one side of the building, um, and of course also the, the solar uh, light facing south was used to warm up uh, uh, the, the building during the winter and was shielded during the, during the summer. So the social condition, the health of the people was uh, regarded, but also uh, maintenance and uh, very technical aspect regarding maintenance and uh, renewal uh, were studied, when to apply which technology uh, where, uh, in terms of uh, not only affordability, uh, but planning the strategy of, uh, of the maintenance, the strategy of the renewal, the strategy of the transformation. Of the building, uh, of the building itself, taking into, into account the, the use, and taking into account also the flows of resources uh, of heat and, uh, and water, energy, for instance. With the same office, uh, um, uh, we work on several projects, and the main, of course, action was the use of materials, which sometimes can be has to be very uh, technical uh, uh, and also very innovative. Uh, like in this case, uh, uh, we transformed an existing building uh, reusing uh, some uh, tables, uh, some uh, panels, uh, which were from, uh, from tables of a, of a big corporation. So we use these gray uh, panels uh, for uh, interiors, uh, uh, for floors and, um, and, uh, the, um, and, and walls. Uh, and we also use the um, leftover matrix of a car factory, um, like as you can see for the, yeah, the 
in the bottom right hand side of, of the picture. For the staircase boxes uh, and for the uh, stairs. And uh, when they're using these materials, sometimes the worker, of course, very often the workers were not used to, to it, to, 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 to these materials, and they were new for them. And um, they were not sometimes not so creative. Um, for them, it was not so easy to find solution or to reuse this material. So we hard we hard we started to collaborate uh, also with some artists. And these artists were uh, more often uh, um, able to find uh, um, unique uh, solution, innovative solutions to reuse these materials for a for a different purpose. They were uh, originally designed designed for. And uh, still uh, uh, regarding the, the limitations, uh, in particular the health, uh, the health limitation of the sustainable intervention, uh, when with Super U Studios with the same office, uh, um, we reused the wind turbine for, a, for building a playground in Rotterdam. We did not only perform a life cycle analysis of the materials, finding out how much energy was spent to, to work and to transport these materials compared to a standard playground, uh, but uh, we also uh, we also um, performed an human health risk assessment, finding out if these materials were poisonous or proper to be used by children, since they were originally designed for an industrial use for a wind turbine. So uh, these are uh, indeed uh, um, the um, uh, this was the second part of the um, of the lecture. Regarding like contemporary Dutch approach, uh, let's say, which is, and the last part, which uh, regard the education, um, it's uh, it's uh, um, illustrating uh, an harvest map uh, which we were using with Super U Studios uh, while working at the kid at the Royal Academy of uh, of Den Haag, the Aig. Uh, so students were using the harvest uh, map uh, um, as a tool in their design, but also they were using uh, uh, the concept of, uh, of uh, not only reusing the, the, the flows of materials, but reusing, optimizing the flows of natural uh, and the human-made resources. So within a system, which can be a building or which can be a neighborhood, uh, it is important. Uh, the students were focusing on the, um, optimizing the flows uh, which are within the system and also uh, the flows which are coming in and going out from the system. So for instance, in the first uh, design studio, the system was a building, was the, was the um, Minister of Justice. And uh, the student, one student was, for instance, uh, um, rethinking uh, the use of the ground floor, uh, transforming the ground floor into a public uh, space uh, with skateboard uh, uh, with a skateboard park. Um, so it took some uh, some uh, materials, the wood uh, from another floor. Uh, it transported the, the, the wood and he even built a one to one scale uh, model of one of the ramp and, uh, and a bench. Uh, showing it. Uh, so let's say his skills of uh, do it your his do it yourself skill uh, we had a lot of fun because we were able uh, with the students to go into the building which was about to be demolished uh, we had this opportunity so we visited in, indeed uh, several floors and uh, yeah we were also able to physically take off materials and to transform the materials uh, another example uh, um, it is uh, at the TU Delft uh, this time. Uh, it was with uh, Jasper Janssen from a Danish, uh, uh, Danish uh, studio, GXN. And this time the system uh, was enabled, enabled in Amsterdam, enabled which is uh, about to be transformed, partially demolished. So um, with the students, uh, we, did, um, we did an inventory inventory of, uh, of materials which are possible to use and possible to recycle uh, materials from this uh, from this neighborhood uh, which are illustrated here in, in 3d not only that uh, especially uh, for instance one of the students uh, uh, he redesigned the, the, the structure of the new buildings in the neighborhood 
uh, which were uh, the circular circle building, a circular building, way easier to uh, reuse, to, to demount and remount. Um, so it was, let's say, very much focusing on the third uh, limitation of the maintenance and renewal of the, of the uh, sustainable technological uh, intervention. So in his uh, project uh, and, and the current project, as he, as he called it, um, the current project was very easy to transform and evolve in the future while the old situation was, uh, the, the, the existing building was uh, uh, really easy to transform. So the only possibility was to take off some materials and tear and tear down uh, the building to recycle some part while in his new proposal, the, in the, the, the current, uh, let's say, as uh, the, um, the circular cornerstone, as, as he called it, um, was indeed possible to um, uh, in this uh, circular building detail, uh, let's say, uh, was uh, was way easier to, to transform and to, to evolve in the future. It was also regarding to the other limitations, like for instance, the, uh, the social condition, he was studying um, the approach and then uh, and, um, how the building uh, relates to the context. And it was also regarding the other limitation the, uh, concerning uh, health, um, being sure that the buildings were uh, meeting the health uh, requirement. And um, so this is uh, this was his, uh, his design. And um, this, is, this was also, let's say, the third part of the lecture. In the three part, uh, we were always uh, investigating the and the, the, the architectural approaches regarding uh, materials reuse and um, concerning also the, the limitations. And uh, as a final remark, uh, also uh, another uh, couple of case studies uh, which are related to the concept of a harvest map and uh, which are related to the concept of architectural approaches uh, regarding material reuse. Is the Oslo to uh, example from Europe? The Oslo 2019 architectural triennale, architectural triennale was called the architecture of the growth, and some ideas uh, came out uh, were listed by uh, by the scene and by the catalog. Um, one of these uh, ideas from a Gisto studio, an Italian studio, was uh, source material first, design second. So instead of uh, the other standard, let's say way around, uh, when the client. Um, um, yeah, is asking to, to, to come up with a concept first and then finding the materials for it. Uh, first, uh, design uh, with, them, with, with the materials which are available on the site, right. which is uh, exactly, which is, I could hear something, oh, maybe. Um, which is exactly uh, the, same, uh, mm, the same approach uh, which was taken by super user and by the secondary use group. So first uh, check uh, what's available in the, in the area and then, and then design design together with the uh, with the harvesting the materials in the in, in the in the area. And then the second concept uh, is uh, you recycle material for a bespoke solution. So uh, already tries to think a strategy about the reuse of the materials, the design of the materials, how it can be reused, also being flexible in the reuse uh, for different uh, function it was designed for, and. Um, yeah, I would say I would add uh, always uh, having in mind uh, the three limitations. In this case, uh, the third limitation, maintenance and renewal, is uh, regarded, but always having in mind the social condition and the health uh, of the people with to, to make sure of, let's say, to increase the chances that the uh, design uh, will be successful. Yeah, this is this was uh, the, my lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. I um, yeah, I'm always very interested in your work because uh, being a designer, I'm always very uh, afraid of uh, being limited. I do have questions for you. I would like those our guests and the students to go first if they do have some urgent questions. Otherwise, I'll break the silence. So let's see if I see anybody that wants to ask questions. You can verbalize them or you can type them. Okay. Well, then I'll break the silence. Oh, Helen, hi. Yes, hi. Um, let me take off my mask. One yeah. second. <laughs> oh. 
Okay. Um, so it strikes me that the, the um, solutions that you're proposing are, are creative and they're really wonderful, but they also are uh, generally small scale. How would you scale something like this up to larger buildings or larger projects? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you for, uh, for asking that. And uh, yeah, we were actually investigating, it is a also correct remark. And uh, um, we were actually investigating uh, uh, this aspect, uh, especially uh, in the last uh, example, and together with the Asper Janssen uh, from GXN, they do uh, actually uh, also uh, larger scale projects. And together with them, uh, we were uh, working with some students indeed. Uh, we focus on some aspects, for instance, the, the circular building, uh, working on the detail of some buildings. And then uh, if uh, we scale up these details, we can make it, let's say, industrial. Industrial, uh, hopefully, still uh, in a circular, uh, in a with a circular goal. Uh, then, when is uh, um, to a some extent, we use the prefabrication uh, to create something which is very easy to mount and demount. And together with that, uh, we need a strategy on uh, um, when we will. Uh, um, disassemble and reassemble the building and how much energy and how much new materials we will need every time. Uh, so yeah, let's say this, uh, uh, this approach regarding uh, uh, scalability, uh, but also uh, let's say an industrial approach uh, and regarding lots of uh, uh, strategy and planning uh, was uh, one of the responses uh, to an upgrade in terms of, of scale. That we make. That we gave. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, on this wave, um, Piero, do you guys yeah. rely on uh, contract uh, spe uh, specific contractors that disassemble for you? Is there already a culture out there, or do you do it yourself? How how does it how does um, this this construct deconstruct uh, construction? Um, yeah phase happens. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your, your question. That's also a very good point. Uh, still is a, let's say, pioneering, uh, I would say, most of the time activity. Uh, so it really uh, uh, needs some cooperative, cooperative practice uh, practices, let's say, some cooperation between the different stakeholders, uh, because most of the time, um, at least so far, the architect uh, were uh, initiating and doing uh, most of the job and also asking, of course, for uh, some help. Lately, only in the last couple of years, there are some companies in Holland, in the Netherlands, who are indeed going to the building site and uh, taking off uh, uh, the still usable materials. So saving these materials, these window frame, valuable um, pieces of floor, whatever, and then building a physical banks bank of materials uh, uh, and then these materials are possible to to buy so yeah these are um, and then these materials they have more and more value as well uh, because there are some new laws in the netherlands uh, where uh, an amount of reused materials and the recycled materials uh, are mandatory in the building uh, so uh, new buildings need to have at least as, as certain amount of uh, reused and or recycled materials uh, and sometimes these reused materials can be not so easy to find uh, so yeah then they go to these uh, companies which already took uh, some materials from the from uh, from building sites which are about to be demolished uh, and uh, yeah these materials can also increase their value let's say in the because of these reasons interesting and this, uh, in this, this yeah 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 mm -hmm. I mean, for, yeah. Uh, what you just mentioned is you said that it's yeah. uh, it's sort of uh, um, the law that you need to reuse some materials for yeah. both used as uh, sorry for both upcycle or for both renovations as well as new buildings. Uh, I think it depends. Also, all of these uh, laws are new, and it depends on the function of the building. Uh, it also I'm, I'm not completely sure to be honest, but I mean since there is this law now that it uh, that is mandatory to use uh, some. Uh, reused and some recycled materials and then um, yeah the market is changing also the people working on these uh, on these activities are uh, are more and uh, new companies are coming uh, are coming out and new let's say 
yeah, activities and businesses are coming out. Great. I think Chris has a question because he has a video. Hi hey there. Uh, thank you. Um, I uh, was wondering, are, are you are you able to harvest structural type materials like steel or beams, um, or is it mostly uh, finished type materials or uh, facades or decoration type things that you use? Um, I, I imagine you might have to certify or recertify structural members. Yeah, that's also another good point. Thank you for asking. Uh, certificate, I mean, uh, certified reused materials. We still don't have a certification for used materials. I'm, uh, I'm quite confident that it's coming out. They're working on it. Of course, it's not easy to, to certify or use materials because maybe, I mean, you want to reuse the materials in many times for a different function it was, uh, it was designed for. So it's also probably a difficult regulation to, to compile, uh, but they're working on it because there is a lot of attention of, uh, yeah, um, Indeed, also regarding the limitation, uh, uh, to what extent the materials uh, can be reusable, if there is a certification for that, any guarantees. Um, and and um, regarding the other question that you that you asked, uh, it depends. Of course, sometimes some materials are a, a bit complex to extract and to reuse. So in that case, these materials can be recycled, for instance. Um, yeah, can be iron or wood. But it really depends uh, on the specific context, on the specific situation. I mean, some parts of uh, steel or wood, even some structural part can be reused. It also, uh, some others, is, is a bit too complex, so it's easier to recycle, let's say. But it also, it also depends uh, on the way the building is built. So that's why I was showing the example of uh, if something is easy to assemble and disassemble, then it will also uh, weigh uh, be way easier to, to reuse a structural component in the future. Um, when talking about material, you also spoke about, and especially in this slide, I think, or the slide before, you spoke about an inventory yeah. that you, you do. You do an inventory before proceeding on anything. Uh, we, have, uh, we had a guest that unfortunately canceled, but he's going to come up uh, again. And uh, he's from, he is actually one of the co-founders of Madaster. I don't know if you know them. They are Dutch based, in, they are based in Amsterdam and they make um, a material passport. So they really trace down the year of the material, the, like if, the, if that is the first life of the material and everything. Basically, they, they give a passport to this material. Uh, are you familiar with that? And do you use it when doing the inventory? I mean, do you cross? Uh, I don't know, cross-contaminate cross each other? Uh, well, yeah, I, um, I know I've been here about the uh, material passport. Uh, I think it's part uh, of the activity, which is very interesting. It's part of the activities which are in, uh, in development. Uh, all of the activities I've been mentioning, also these new laws, as everything quite new, also these new companies. And yeah, material passports is something very useful to trace the history of the materials, also the possible, let's say, contamination in terms of, uh, of poisons and also to classify the material as possible to reuse for one user, but maybe not another use in direct contact with human being. So it's something very useful. Um, in terms of uh, uh, me, uh, when I was working at Super U Studios, we were not uh, um, working on our material passport. And uh, yeah, also I am uh, not really focusing on material passport in my research and in my teaching, but uh, yeah, it is a, a definitely very interesting uh, path. And these are uh, also, let's say, uh, part uh, of the certification discourse uh, we were uh, investigating before, we were talking about before, because uh, yeah, the more information we have about the material, yeah, the more criteria you have for a possible certification of this material to be reused or uh, recycled. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And now probably this leads also to a question about design, because I'm sure the students are interested yeah. in this. So you mentioned, and it's uh, thank you for uh, filling the gap before I had to ask, you mentioned collaborating with artists uh, sometimes. Yes. Um, can you explain yeah. a little bit in w at which phase do they come in? Do they come in during the concept of the design? Do they come in into the application? How is the collaboration really working? Yes. 
Yeah, they came in along the design, uh, during the design process, uh, let's say, for instance, in this case, the artist was suggesting how to reuse the, we were discussing with them how to reuse uh, some of these gray panel, which used to be um, table from a, from a corporation. Uh, also, how to how to reuse it, uh, uh, where, uh, and also a lot about the detail and connection, more even more regarding the uh, the steel part. So the uh, the boxes, uh, um, how to in terms of uh, welding, uh, in terms of aesthetic appearance, uh, uh, also meaning. Uh, um, so the, the artist was part, of course, of the um, of the concept design uh, and of the do it yourself and, uh, and of the of the building part uh, of the construction uh, of the construction phase. Um, yeah. So I mean, when uh, uh, we are working in these uh, unusual uh, design uh, processes, uh, uh, the client is very important for the client to be part of the design process because the client also needs to be flexible and understand the specificity and the and the um, unique, let's say, potentials and limitation of the um, of, of the situation of the design, of the process. Also, the provider of materials, we need a cooperative practices, practice also with the materials providers, which can be businesses uh, who give us the, the materials for free, or uh, which even give us uh, some money for the materials, uh, because uh, otherwise they would have paid uh, another company, um, um, company to get rid of these materials, they would have paid more another company to get rid of these materials. Um, and also, of course, and, and we need to cooperate with them in order to, to know when exactly we can have the materials, uh, when they can bring it to us, when we can go to pick it up, because it's not just like, of course, ordering new materials and uh, that you can change your mind, you can order more. Uh, so you need collaboration also for them. Also, where to store the materials, if they can store it for you or where you can store the materials. So let's say it's a cooperative practice. Uh, it's not uh, only about uh, technique or technology or, or laws. Is a cooperative practice because it's, uh, it's about doing something new and uh, everyone needs to cooperate uh, and uh, also the design process uh, is a uh, um, it's every time uh, new uh, it, it cannot really be uh, defined uh, and everyone is involved uh, along the entire uh, design process yeah it's uh, for sure it's a different way of thinking about design right being yourself an architect have you experienced um limitations like uh, you clearly need to satisfy a client, you clearly need to satisfy probably a city, you need to satisfy a budget, you need to satisfy a lot of things, right? And you also need to find and harvest material that is uh, nearby, otherwise the method collapses, right? Um, sincerely speaking, do you yeah. find limitations in, in this process? And uh, following up this, uh, this question is, how do you disseminate your knowledge? How do you make uh, architectural offices aware of the potentials that there are in uh, upcycling material and seeing that as a, as a, I don't know, I wouldn't say profitable, but I will say a very good practice to implement in, in, in one's office. What is your, yeah, what is your uh, elevator pitch for a designer that is just used to be, you know, at the center of the attention and trying to design without really be limited too much about uh, the environmental constraints. Yeah, I mean, since I work at the university, I try to to spread the knowledge and the culture about these examples. So that's <laughs> and uh, also when I work with my practice, uh, we try to use some of these concepts. So that's let's say uh, part of our uh, of our mission to to to. Um, spread the knowledge uh, to make more uh, more people sensitive regarding these uh, uh, these approaches but i would say uh, the role uh, the role of the architect is very is very crucial in these uh, design processes because uh, uh, to try to build uh, something like uh, yeah the examples i've been uh, i've been showing and to finally also uh, yeah from the first to the last uh, to the last uh, phase, from the design process to the construction phase, and, and then to the maintenance and renewal phases, and maybe to the disassemble phases, which is already planned ahead. 
the architects need to take several different roles. So it cannot be only a designer, but needs to be also a researcher, needs to be a technologist, needs to be an um, initiator, a divulgator, because the cooperative practice is very important. So needs uh, uh, almost to be an engineer, needs to take even more, uh, more role, more roles, uh, let's say in a further developed way, uh, compared to uh, standard, uh, let's say, um, design processes when uh, the client is asking you to build something uh, new with materials which are already available. So do you have, uh, so specifically clients come to you because of, uh, they know, they do know your speciality. They know that they will find um, harvest meth and uh, that type of design uh, out of your product you know, out, out of your office is like, my, basically my yeah. curiosity is how do you sell it to a client that is used, uh, that is used not to do, to, to face these uh, constraints, you know, and how do you sell it to the designer yeah. that makes his or her living out of, you know, a paycheck from a client. And it's important yes. since you yeah, work not, at the yeah. university, you know, you're, you're facing, uh, you're facing students on a daily basis. And I would like, uh, I would yeah. like to challenge you to challenge my students to think this way for their next design process for you a project for instance. How do you convince them that it's, that it's the right way to go and that is the future? Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, I've been working for this uh, for this practice. Now I mainly work at the university, and then for my practice, which does things. Uh, uh, things. I mean, still we are trying to do projects uh, which are related uh, to the use of uh, flows of natural and uh, human-made resources. But anyways. Uh, uh, what I've been uh, seeing, I'm still working, uh, collaborating with uh, with super use and with other practices, mainly in the research at the moment and in other university and in the in the teaching. What I see, um, of course, I'm also researching on, on the topic. I see that there is more and more attention uh, in terms of uh, reuse and recycle. So also some clients, of course, there are the clients who really like the aesthetic, the design, the concept of reuse materials, and they go to these practices to ask for exactly the same. Yes, uh, there are other clients which are, let's say, more forced to go that way because of the new regulations and also because they are uh, somehow interested in, in some aspects. This is more people asking for it. Also, super use studios at the moment, they're also more and more consultants. They become, they're still architects, but they are also consultants because many people go there, other architects or clients, they go there to ask them um, a consultancy uh, about the direction where to go uh, in terms of doing similar things, in terms of material reuse, in terms of uh, of the um, circularity building with circular material. So still related to the role of the architect, architects which have been innovative, uh, which have been proposing something new, uh, maybe uh, something less standard and more difficult to, to do at the moment, um, at the time, and uh, less profitable at the time. Then they, they learn new skills. Now we are living in times where everything is changing. New jobs are coming out. And also the role of the architect, the job of the architects are changing. So um, super students, for instance, now they're also consultant and they consult uh, yeah, many different uh, uh, clients and stakeholders uh, about material reuse, about circularity in the built environment. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also the aesthetics because of uh the harvest math, right? The aesthetic depends on this 25 kilometers, right? I mean, you cannot predict, you cannot predict the aesthetics before you you make yeah, an yeah, accurate yeah. Uh, search. Yeah, 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 exactly. You cannot, uh, you cannot predict it. Uh, for sure, you cannot predict it. Um, I mean, there is a big part of it, which is unpredictable which will be unveiled only during the design process. You can have a rough idea of uh, what do you want, uh, but uh, yeah, big part of it, it will come out. Yeah, that's, uh, that's indeed uh, uh, very fascinating. And um, it is a part of the unpredictability of uh, also of, uh, of current times, let's say.
Yeah, talking about contextuality, right? Hey, Chris, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I was just thinking about the selling of it. I, I would think it, it would be a pretty easy sell to clients uh, because people, you know, like if, if they're doing a remodel, I, you know, I, I did a project once just as the construction portion of it, but we reuse uh, like some old, um, it was a very old building. So we reuse some old floor joists that were old tree trunks and we, you know, slice them down and then use them in another component of the house. And <clears throat> I mean, people are, people are very nostalgic and they like, you know, to use old things. And, and I would think if people are spending a lot of money on a building and not remodeling or that they, you know, they, they like things that are unique that they can tell stories about. So, um, and, and they want to show things off. So that's, you know, part of why you hire an architect and, and you have something unique and different. That's a good point. Yeah, no, actually, I mean, there is a, I mean, trend which is going on since a couple of decades, at least uh, of, uh, I mean, trying, uh, I mean, where people can see also the, the, the um, can recognize uh, the beauty, the aesthetic and the fascination and the fascinating aspect of uh, keeping the heritage I mean, what's already there. And of course, transforming it, uh, transforming it maybe with also, yeah, with what uh, was already there somewhere else. So yeah, we see, we've seen a lot of renovation going on. I mean, this, this is a beautiful, uh, uh, all the shipyard, which have been uh, of course transformed, uh, which, can tell so many stories and that's something which is already going on uh, a lot and more and more uh, places have been uh, renovated and then uh, their value is uh, the value increased and indeed also in terms of the use of, uh, of materials for a different purpose they were uh, they were designed for that's something uh, fun uh, which is already going on and um, people People like it, like it, like it, and also um, can be uh, part of it. Uh, is can be also the, the, the do-it-yourself uh, part, uh, and is also part of the fascination uh, where the client can even contribute uh, to uh, to the construction of, of the building. I mean, not only with the do with the do-it-yourself practice, but that's one of the of the practice where the client can be part of the design process and you need this new uh, new way of design this new design processes where i mean all the roles are kind of uh, interchangeable and then client can also be uh, yeah part of the take sometimes the part of the of the worker or or the architect along along the process Finally, Piero, do you know your counterpart here across the across the ocean? Is there any company or firm or consultancy office that you are familiar of in the US? Um, doing uh, similar things. Of course, I mean, I know um, some uh, renowned uh, let's say work like for instance rural studio uh, they um, or uh, I didn't focus maybe so much uh, I know rural studio for instance I'm interested in sample from them uh, I don't know maybe but maybe you can <laughs> Respond, help me. I mean, yeah, and, uh, maybe I should, uh, reply right? Reply to this question, which, <laughs> yeah, 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 which will, I mean, <laughs> I be can't. very interesting for me because yeah. I don't know many. Eh? <laughs> I, I can't, many, but, but I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure there are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, um, my question comes out of pure curiosity and see if there is a market for you on this side of the pond and see whether you can expand, uh, you know, Expand, expand your knowledge around here. It will, it will be interesting to do a little no, research. No, for sure, for sure. I mean, I, I've been focusing on Europe also because I was working with Europe and with, uh, I mean, some of the people I was uh, focusing, they were also then teaching at the TUDEF or collaborating the research. And then I've been focusing the seventies. So I know what, uh, what uh, was going on in the seventies in Europe and the, in the US. Uh, I'm not so much focused on very similar practices going on in the in recent years in the US, but yeah, would be, 
absolutely very interesting to to investigate and to know more about it yeah yeah i think that uh, you can also look at the, the uh, of course urban uh, rural studio is a good example but there is also a branch of the university of utah in utah very close to uh okay. salt lake city it's called bluff it's a it's a location and uh the school is called design built bluff you can take a look they uh they design a lot for navajo nation okay. the um the um, native americans and they design oh, houses it's it's the same concept as rural studio but extremely specific for uh indian american first nation thank you piero okay. thank cool. you very much thank for you. Thank you. all you do to the world and also for being an architect <laughs> so understanding the challenges that okay. we have in this so I, uh, I, I hope that we can keep in touch and get more information from you as time goes by. Uh, well, thank you again. Have a nice evening to you and to the students. Thank you for attending and I look forward to see you on Monday. Bye. Thank you, I enjoyed a lot. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Ciao, Piero. Uh -huh.